The 805 Focus is brought to you in part by Nonprofit Connect. Nonprofit Connect provides superior leadership tools and resources so nonprofit leaders and board members can make valuable decisions to move their organization forward to a sustainable and vibrant future. More information on services online at nonprofitconnect.org. Welcome to 805 Focus. I'm Dr. Cinder Sinclair with Nonprofit Connect, and we will be bringing you the latest on your favorite nonprofits. So get ready to be inspired. Our special guest today is David Tillman, and David is a professor at the Bryn School at UCSB. Welcome, David. A pleasure to be here, thank you. Oh gosh, I know you have a big story to tell, lots of important things going on there at Bryn School. What an amazing place that is. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us a little bit about Bryn School and your work there? I'd be delighted. So uh, your intro mentions the environment. Bryn School is a, is a school dedicated to finding solutions, workable solutions for humanity and the earth. Uh, so sustaining the environment in the long term. We want the world to be as livable or more livable in 100 years and 1,000 years as it is right now. So we do lots of different kinds of research. There are 30 faculty members who do research and then there are PhD students and uh, many master's students, all of whom are dedicated to finding ways to sustain this environment that we live in at the same time having this, this sustainability be done in a way that meets other human needs. We, we don't want to have to sacrifice quality of life for the environment. We think the two can go hand in hand. So we're looking for these win-win solutions. Wow. That's what a, an inspiring mission that is. It really is. It's a, I, I'm delighted to be part of it. Uh, I, every time when I teach our incoming class of 80 to 90 master's students who want to get a master's degree in environmental sustainability, I just cannot believe how lucky I am to be talking to these people who are, who are going to go out and dedicate their lives to helping us have a more livable earth. So 80 to 90 mm -hmm. master's mm -hmm. level students and then you said there's also PhD. A PhD. Each year we admit oh uh, seven to ten PhD students. So there are probably forty-five or so PhD students in our program right now. And uh, clearly that's a, a deeper level of research uh, mm -hmm. that, that they will be performing in the future. But again, the unique thing about our program, we have economists, uh, a, a professor of law, uh, sociologists, uh, political scientists, uh, business uh, people, um, and ecologists. And we're trying to work together as, as a big team to find out solutions that really are sustainable, that are economically viable, that, that, that are fair and just across different peoples in this country and around the world, all of the various constraints that you have to play with to come up with a true, real solution that people will want to adopt. That's what we're trying to do. Gosh, and so you have to find people for your team who kind of buy into the assumption that it's even possible to work together in this, toward this uh, in that would be so challenging. Yes, and it's interesting to see people because some people come to us uh, as new new PhDs and they've not done something like this before and uh, they they sort of slowly they get to learn what happens is you learn from other people. Okay. You talk with your colleagues who are in different programs who do different kinds of science than you do and you you hear what they find interesting, they hear what you find interesting, you find some common ground, you start sharing the same language, because every scientific discipline, every social science discipline has its own language, its own way of thinking. So it takes time to be able to learn from each other. But once you've done that, once you've invested, then you have this chance to have all these wonderful collaborative interactions uh, where uh, their skills and your skills can mesh up to try to find solutions to a problem. Wow. So how do students, potential students, find out about Bren? Well, um, we're fairly well known. For instance, um, uh, last year, the year before, we were rated the number one unbusiness school in mm -hmm. the country. Wow. Now, unbusiness was sort of, because our program is sort of half MBA and half yeah. environmental sciences. Okay. So it sort of blends those two together. Um, and so we're known that way. Um, there are uh, sort of in academics, uh, People know about programs, they also know about certain professors who are famous for their work on different subjects, and we have people in our program who are 
scientists who have had very high impact in their own disciplines and therefore they're known and they someone might come to work with a certain person someone might come uh -huh. because they've heard of Bren's reputation okay so, so if a student uh, maybe or somebody watching this program wants to find out more they can go to your website right which I know is on the screen right. yeah the Bren website uh, has all the information you'd need to learn about the actual programs we have we have three major programs uh, a master's in environmental science and management um, mm -hmm. And that program, uh, you can be trained to be uh, an environmental entrepreneur to try to help you learn how to find some product that you can make that will actually help the environment, but also that people want to buy. So the goal is, I tell my students, I want you to get rich by doing good for the environment. <laughs> oh, and and there are people trying to do this. I just, I think it's a fabulous program. Other people want to help corporations be better for the environment. So they, they sort of come into the branch on, on corporate environmental sustainability and when they get done they want to get a job with a corporation and work with that corporation to uh, increase its, uh, in, its uh, environmental goodness if you will. And then the other ones have various things but a lot of those people want to go into the nonprofit world and mm -hmm. work for nonprofits that are dedicated to uh, solving environmental problems. So like maybe our local CEC uh, Community Environmental Council? Something like that, sure. Yeah. Uh, and the Nature Conservancy, the Audubon oh. Society, okay, okay. Uh, the World Wildlife Fund, lots and lots of organizations. Um, so there's that, that's one track. Another track, you know, we're in this world now where there's just an immense amount of data and, yeah. and old ways of looking at it just weren't getting us very far. So we've started a new master's in environmental data uh, uh, program where students come in and they learn how to try to find solutions to these problems that we face by looking at this huge data set that is out there in the world and pulling those numbers together. So those are the two master's programs. Each one takes about two years. Oh, uh, the okay. environmental science is a bit faster because it goes through the summer also. And the third is a PhD. Um, and uh, a PhD is, is a much deeper research experience. You have to write a thesis that does something unique and different and so mm -hmm. on. And that takes most people about five or maybe six years to be done. Ah, wow. So um, that's a, a much slower program. Uh, but it, and each one opens different doors. So it depends on what someone wants to do. Yeah. And a lot of them probably discover what they want to do while they're there. Well, that's really the truth. They come in having this sense of what they might want to do. Uh -huh. But they take classes, uh, they read books, they read scientific papers, they go to seminars and hear of people who are visiting campus telling us about their work they're doing. And they sort of discover in that what they really want to do. And it's really fun to see this discovery take I place. Bet. It's just this, this maturing of somebody to becoming a scientist and, and uh, to having the knowledge to uh, address these big problems that the world faces and try to find solutions to them. And that's what keeps you so young. You're right. constantly working with those young folks that are discovering new things every oh, day. Yeah, it's so much fun. And it's, you know, it's sort of, they almost become a little bit like an intellectual child of yours, right? Yes, yes, and you're their yes. mentor and you're helping them. And then they grow up and they leave you. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> then you get another one and another one and so on. Uh, but uh, it's interesting because uh, most professors remember every single student they ever trained for a PhD. I've had maybe oh. 32 people and we, we're in contact. We email each other, oh. we see each other at times and so on. So it's really, it just, uh, the academic world is, this, is a very sort of cohesive social unit. Uh, mm -hmm. I know scientists who are like me all around the world. I mean, I travel around the world, I see them, and, and they're my friends, and, and they wow. come and see me, and so on. It's, re it's a really uh, uh, amazingly wonderful life. That is great. And so now, you know, you talked about data mm -hmm. a minute ago, and we're all kind of surrounded by data everywhere, mm -hmm. and some people can make something of it, and mm -hmm. others is just data, right? Mm -hmm. But it sounds like your students learn how to take that data and solve real world problems. Right, absolutely. And so um, I'll, I'll just give an example. The, most of the people who work directly with me are now concerned with, with um, issues related to what I call uh, the question of uh, can we feed the world mm. and still save the earth? And it turned, you know, the two biggest needs we have as a species are energy. We use an immense amount of energy mm -hmm. that doesn't come from our own bodies. That's the old, old kind of energy. We use yeah. fossil energy and now we're using solar and so on. And the, the old way of getting energy from burning fossil fuels has, as we know, major climate impacts. And that's mm -hmm. a serious issue we have to solve. But now that we're feeding 8 billion people 
and the people that are being fed are richer and richer. They're demanding different diets. They're demanding a lot more meat. Mm -hmm. um, we tend, as we get richer, to waste a lot more food than we did before. And in many oh. rich countries, we're actually taking food crops and we're turning it into liquid fuels for our cars, hmm. which I think is a little bit immoral because we have 800 million people around the world who are malnourished. They don't hmm. get enough calories. And we burn in our cars just in the United States many more times the food that they need to live a healthy oh life. Oh my gosh. So I, that, right. that bothers me on an ethical yeah, issue. As long I as a scientist, so. it's not just all numbers. I think there also has to be an appreciation for uh, humanity, an appreciation for the goodness of all people on earth, and a desire to treat everybody fairly. Because I think you have to fit all these things together. In the long term, society doesn't, uh, does not accept inequality. People rebel against inequality. And so I think that uh, if we really want to have a sustainable world, we have to find solutions that can, that can be win solutions for everyone, not just for the few rich people in a rich country or whatever it might be. Right. And so your work sounds like there's this very sort of delicate balance between two opposing sort of ideas, mm -hmm. you know. So right. Right. maybe yes. you could well, talk no, about there is, that. Yes. Um, I mean, it, it's, so let's talk about, I'll talk about food thing I know the most. So as people get to be more wealthy, and this is happening to people all around the world, even the people in the poorest countries, which are mainly in Sub-Saharan Africa, they actually have the, on a percent basis, the fastest growing economies. And when people get a bit more money, they buy more of what they prefer. And for many people, this is they buy more meat. And the you know, meat can be an important part of a healthy diet. Too much meat is not healthy, but the right amount of meat is healthy. But it takes a lot of resources to make that meat. For instance, for beef, it takes about 20 um, pounds of protein and animal feed to get one pound of beef that we can actually eat. Whereas the same stuff that is animal feed, that's wheat, corn, soybeans, and so on. There's also people feed. And the poorest people in the world can't afford the meats but we can afford meat so much in the richer countries that we cause the prices of these grains to be so high oh. that the poor people oh. can't even afford to buy the very uh, plant-based foods they tend to eat. So there's this, wow. this, yeah. this inequality right now, which really bothers me. I, I view access to a healthy and secure diet as something I would I say is a human right. Uh -huh. And I think uh, in the richer countries, we have to be aware, not just of what we do to our own citizens, but how our actions impact everyone else around the world, especially the world's poor, and they do impact them. And especially, for instance, turning corn into ethanol. 40% of the corn grown in the United States, and we grow the most corn of any country, goes into ethanol. And because of that, the prices of, of wheat, rice, uh, and, and other grains uh, is higher than it would be otherwise. We use so much land that could have produced something else, it forces the price of all of those crops up. And uh, this has been hurting the poorest people of the world. So that, that's something that concerns me. Um, so how do we do our work? Let me tell you a little bit about that. Yeah. We gather lots and lots of data, country by country, all around the world from various sources. So we analyze what kinds of foods people have, what the diets are in each country. We analyze how they grow the crops for their diet, how good their yields are, how much food can get, get off an acre of land, how might they be able to improve that. We analyze the impacts of how crops are grown. For instance, in the United States, uh, we apply more fertilizer than re we really need to. Mm. And because of that, the excess fertilizer uh, pollutes water, causes mm -hmm. a dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico where the Mississippi drains the whole Midwest uh, Corn Belt. Um, a, a part of the nitrogen gets converted by bacteria in the soil into a very potent greenhouse gas called nitrous oxide. Mm. And that nitrous oxide, just from excess fertilizer around the world, gives us 10% of all the global warming we do every year. In fact, agriculture itself is 30% of all the global warming on Earth. Wow. And if you look at what's happening with diets, how they're changing, what's happening to human population, how it's changing, and what's happening with, with income around the world, if we stopped all fossil fuel combustion right now, but we didn't change the, the direction agriculture is going, mm -hmm. agriculture itself would warm the world past the two degree limit that the Paris Accord said was as far as we should dare go in warming the world. So we have to change agriculture, and we're trying to find ways to do this that provide people with delicious, healthy, secure diets, 
uh, and that decreases the uh, nitrous oxide that comes from that. Mm -hmm. Uh, we really have to be use fertilizer more efficiently, and frankly, we have to eat less beef. That is ah. a huge source of another greenhouse gas. Ten percent of our global emissions come basically from methane, mainly from mm -hmm. from growing beef. Um, and there are lots of healthy diets that do this. We've studied lots of these diets, and in fact, the healthiest diets for humans are also the healthiest diets for the planet. Mm -hmm. So I mean, like the Mediterranean diet, where uh -huh. you eat you eat a serving or two of beef a week, but no more than that. Your main meat is fish. Mm -hmm. It's rich in vegetables, rich in fruits, rich in whole grains. It's mm -hmm. a very healthy diet. And the Mediterranean diet can be delicious. Yes. Um, and there are diets like that that are also delicious if you go to Japan or if you go to India that are delicious, healthy, and are much more environmentally beneficial. So one of my mysteries is how, how do we convince people to change what they eat? Oh, and how do you convince farmers to use, that they should use less uh, fertilizer. Well, the less fertilizer is interesting. Um, in Mexico, uh, where the whole thing called the Green Revolution, this use of fertilizer to get higher yields started in 1960, um, the government used to subsidize fertilizer and Mexican farmers used lots of fertilizer. When the government quit uh, uh, subsidizing it and farmers had to buy their own fertilizer, they cut down their fertilizer use by about 25% but they applied it in a way that it didn't hurt their yields at all. Wow. And that was a huge benefit because all that extra fertilizer ends up becoming pollutant. If it's not in the crop, it pollutes the environment. And the same thing happened in the European Union, but there they passed a law where farmers had to gather data, have their soil tested for its nitrogen level, look at their mm -hmm. yields and go through these equations and so on that the, the government did for them. And the government said, here's how much fertilizer you can buy. Here's your permit to buy this amount of fertilizer. And farmers are all mad about this, and I can't blame them because farmers mm -hmm. are insecure. They need that yield to, to earn their living. Yeah. And it turns out uh, their, uh, their fertilizer use went down, as you'd expect, but the yields have continued to increase just along the same increasing line they had been for the last 30 years. Wow. So with the right knowledge in the hands of a farmer, uh, you can do this. The best study on this was done, included 20 million small farmers in China. Oh. In China, the typical farm is only two to five acres in size. Uh -huh. And it's literally almost always farmed by hand. If you can believe it, they hoe it, they, they cut Gee. their crops. It's ancient, but they have high yields. And they were using the most nitrogen of any country in the world because China doesn't have a lot of good land. And they mm -hmm. had to get the most food off the land they had just to feed their people. Um, and, they, uh, and a group uh, did a lot of these analyses on how much fertilizer has to be added on this soil with this climate, with this crop. Uh, and then farmers are asked to adopt those practices and some are asked not to, and they compared them. And it was about 15% less fertilizer, but the yields actually went up a bit by adding the right amount at the right time. So again, it, it can happen. That's amazing. And don't but forget, fertilizer costs a lot of money. Yeah, So yeah, yeah. farmers it who can does. save fertilizer actually can make more profit. Yeah. So, so what, what do you think the chances are of con convincing American farmers that this practice is uh, in their your best interest. Best right? interest. Um, it's it's going to take a lot of education. It'll take doing, um, I would say at the beginning, um, I thought it might be interesting to just set up a company to do something like this. To go, the company would guarantee the farmer the same amount of profit they had on average before. Uh, and, uh, and the company would say, we're going to provide you the exact amount of fertilizer you need and how to apply it. And uh, the farmer would pay less for that fertilizer, uh, but they would pay a little bit more than the fertilizer's cost to pay the company for the knowledge they're providing. And I think if you could get this going, and if it's successful, and there have been some trials without the money involved that have been done that show for maize, at least for corn, uh, that you can have high yields with less nitrogen. If we get something like this going, once farmers see their neighbors doing it and they yes, hear it works, yes, yes. I think it will spread. But they're wisely conservative because most farmers cannot live through more than one or two bad years in a row before they go bankrupt. It's a, it's a very tricky business they're in, and I, I admire them. They provide the world with the food we have to have. We wouldn't be here without the farmers. Yeah. So I, yeah. I don't, nothing I say is intended to, in any way, disparage farming as a profession sure, sure. and so on. It's incredibly important. But with eight billion of us, we have to find the wisest way to do it. Yeah, so it is time to yeah. start doing something different. Right, absolutely. And it sounds like you've got some really important answers to that. Well, we have answers, but the really important answers are the ones that people adopt. Yeah, oh, isn't so, that the truth? So it's easy to run numbers and come up with an idea. Yeah. 
The hard part is asking how do you actually achieve that. Because it requires change and people don't like change. They don't like change and they're afraid that change might hurt them. Yes. Uh, and most people are more afraid of the hurt than they are excited by the possible benefit. So we have to have some societal way where we cover the chance of hurt so no one is hurt as they try out new processes. Uh, and it could be a government funded program that just uh, for a while they say, okay, we will guarantee you'll get at least X amount off your land if you try this new way of growing it and, and have it be a trial process and see what happens. So you have been doing this work for many, many years. I started working, I started as a traditional ecologist, I worked on Lake Michigan and I was called a limnologist. I worked on lakes. Oh. Then I switched to prairies and grasslands and I was very interested in how the world came to have so many species that would compete with each other and coexist, you know, thousands of plant species and insect species and so on. And uh, it sort of grew into agriculture was the biggest threat to diversity, to losing, causing extinctions on earth. Uh -huh. And so I was interested in agriculture, but as soon as I started studying it, I realized we can't get rid of agriculture. It's absolutely essential to our lives. So it took a different turn. Yeah. And I really studied agriculture intently, uh, trying to find these win-win solutions where the farmers are better off and the society is better off. I love it that you're so curious mm -hmm and so open to and embracing new possibilities. Well, um, I became a scientist because I never wanted to be bored. <laughs> uh, and if you're a scientist, I would like to say, if you're a scientist and you're bored, it's your own fault. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are a brilliant scientist well, if you ask me, and we are so lucky to have you at Bren School and in our community. And so thank you for coming on our show and telling our folks all about your important work. It's been my pleasure, thank you. And thank you for joining us on 805 Focus and we'll see you next time.